And we're fortunate today to have Heather Yoakum and um, Andrea Ray be our presenters. They're both with NOAA in Boulder. Um, Heather is a postdoc at um, the University of Colorado and NOAA's Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences. And Andrea is a scientist with NOAA Earth System Research Laboratory, um, all in Boulder. And um, they're going to tell us a little bit, or hopefully a lot, <laughs> about their uh, project in the Prairie Potholes region and the uh, manager's use of climate information. So whenever you're ready, you can get started. Great. Thank you guys very much um, for giving us this opportunity to kind of present this research um, to the group. And um, before I start, I just want to say that this is part of um, a larger NSF-funded project, and so this is kind of the human dimensions and applications side of that project. Um, there we go. Um, so first, I'm going to give you a little bit of the background of what we were actually, kind of our research questions and what we were actually asking um, and what we were interested in in this study. Um, and then I'll give you a, a little intro into the Prairie Potholes region, so some of the decision-making context and the ecological and climate co context in that part of the world. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the methods. So as a social scientist, it's really important to talk about who um, we actually worked with. Um, and then I'll, I'm going to kind of combine our findings and discussion together because it's sort of chunked in several different um, topics, and I think it'll be easier to follow that way. Um, and then I'll end with some key lessons to just kind of give you some takeaway points that if you don't remember anything else, this would be what I would hope you would remember. Um, so first of all, we already know a lot about what users actually need in general um, from climate information. So we know that they need information that is credible, salient, and legitimate. Um, they need to have effective communication and dissemination of that information because if they can't understand it or they can't actually find it, then it doesn't really do them much good. And that also goes for the uncertainties that go along with that information. So being able to explain to potential users um, the limitations of, the, of that um, information that you're passing along. Um, the users also need climate projections that are actually relevant, um, both temporally and geographically, because if it doesn't fit those scales, then it's not much use. Um, they also need information to support their ongoing monitoring and planning activities. Um, so that includes both additional observation, monitoring, and forecast data. So both um, kind of the stuff that we're seeing now, but then the stuff that might happen in the future. And again, that needs to be at the appropriate scales. Um, and they also need, like I said, current and historical data sets, because um, it's very important to be able to create these baselines um, from which they can actually measure change. And we also know that they need more information on potential climate change impacts. And so that includes both better impact models, um, but also tools that explicitly link the ecological processes that they might be interested in for their decision making, um, and then also the climate models that might inform those. Um, and it would also be helpful if they could include some type of GIS compatible data um, so that they're able, so that managers are better able to incorporate that into existing impact models or decision making tools that they already have. Specifically um, for natural resource management, there's also a lot of barriers that kind of go along with some of these existing um, needs that we know about. Um, so, for example, in the natural resource management community, um, again, uncertainty and available information is a big topic that comes up a lot that people don't understand the limitations of the existing climate information that is available, um, and so they're unable to really effectively deploy it. Um, there's also a lack of targeted science information, and so that goes along quite well with the need um, for information at the appropriate scales, um, but also just information that actually matches um, some of the stuff that they're asking for and that's understandable and accessible to them. Um, and then finally, users often say that they have difficulty understanding or applying the available climate products. That includes selecting between or choosing um, different GCMs or different downscaled products, um, but also understanding the interplay between old and new information. So as the um, climate information that we have evolves, um, sometimes it's hard for them to understand what those differences are and when those differences are significant enough to use old or new information instead of the old information. 
Um, and then importantly, there's considerations from the decision-making context. Um, so there's, in some studies, they found that institutional barriers were identified as larger hurdles to climate adaptation than those related to the available science. And this is a really important point because really the usability and accessibility of climate information is not the only consideration when you're looking at how people are using climate information or why they are not using climate information. Um, and so it really fits into this much larger decision-making context which has a significant impact on the ability of individuals or organizations to effectively use climate information to support the decision-making um, that they're trying to do. So they also have reported that they have a lack of capacity to actually include information. And so this includes you know, not um, having exten extensive training in the climate sciences, um, but also just not having enough people to really kind of crunch that data and really incorporate that new information into already um, kind of overtaxed workloads. Um, and then trying to balance all of that with these critical management issues, which would be um, basically anything else that the organization is already dealing with um, when they're trying to do um, land use planning. Um, so one of the things that we were really interested in is, okay, so we know what these general findings say and how it might be helpful to guide the development of more useful information in a broad sense, but specifically, what does credible, salient, and legitimate information actually mean for particular users and specific management decisions? And in this case, we're looking at the prey potholes region. Um, and how can we kind of bridge the gap between these generalities that we sort of understand already, and then what the specifics might be. So what does a more refined analytical product or additional guidance or better impact models actually mean for people in the PPR? Um, so this is to just kind of orient you a little bit to the region that we're talking about. So this is um, a map of the Prairie Potholes region um, outlined in green. It's predominantly in five states. Um, in the upper Midwest and the Great Plains. Um, it gets a little bit into Nebraska, um, but not quite so much as the other areas. Um, and it's really important ecologically for a couple of reasons. So between 50 and 80% of North American ducks breed in the PPR. So all of those cute mallards and pintails and widgeons that you see, a lot of them um, migrate here every year in order to reproduce. But there's also a lot of other um, animals and creatures that make this part of the world home. So there's a lot of migratory grassland and shorebirds. Um, there's larger species like mule deer and pronghorn antelope. And then there's numerous fish and amphibian species that also live in these ponds in the prairie potholes. And so one of the reasons it's called the prairie pothole region is because it's really characterized by this tall and short grass prairie that's sort of broken up by kind of these interspersed um, little potholes. If you can see my pointer kind of circling them in the distance. Um, and so these are wetlands that are um, sometimes permanent, often um, ephemeral or just seasonal. Um, they're fed primarily by uh, rainfall. Um, and they're just sort of interspersed, like I said, throughout the landscape. And they're varying in size. And so socially, the social context, it's important to know that the majority of land in the prairie potholes region is actually owned privately. Um, so this has really important implications for conservation work that goes on up there. So 93% of grassland conservation easements and 60% of the wetland conservation easements are all on private land. Um, and so there's really an interesting um, I guess, cooperation between private landowners and um, state and federal wildlife agencies and also um, private organizations like conservation-oriented nonprofits. Um, and they all work together up there to try to conserve some of these spaces. Um, so there's also some really um, interesting things going on, particularly in North Dakota, with land use change. Um, so the plowing of native prairie and the expansion of corn agriculture is one really important um, aspect of this. Um, and then also the rapid development of oil and natural of the oil and natural gas industry. And again, that's particularly in North Dakota. And so, um, you know, this land use change is really dependent on um, energy prices and um, ag commodity prices um, as it kind of ebbs and flows. Um, 
And finally, there's been a lot of draining or consolidation of wetlands. Um, so since um, European settlement of these areas, the vast majority in some of these states, um, the vast majority of wetlands have actually been drained in order to kind of support this um, agricultural, um, the agricultural sector. Um, but now increasingly, um, oil and natural gas um, development has kind of, um, sometimes these little, especially the little um, ephemeral potholes that don't come back every year or maybe only around for a little bit, they might not necessarily be on maps and people um, that are coming up, the oil and natural gas folk that are coming up there to develop the area might not know about these places. And so some of them just get plowed over or filled in um, without anyone even knowing. Um, or at least the oil and gas people don't know. Some of the wildlife people definitely know. Um, and then there's also decreasing um, federal funds to support conservation initiatives on private land. Um, for example, like the Conservation Reserve Program. And so that really has an impact because, um, like I said, the majority of the land in the Prairie Potholes region is privately owned. So any decrease in those dollars really makes an impact on what um, the extent of the conservation easements that they can procure in those areas. Um, and so just a little bit on the climate. So um, these maps don't show quite the entire region. Um, you only kind of get North and South Dakota and um, Montana, but it does give you a really good idea about the temperature and precip precipitation gradients um, in this part of the world. So in general, it's wetter um, and in the southern part, drier in the northern part, um, and also wetter in the east and drier in the west, um, if that makes sense. And then again with temperature, it is hotter um, in the south and the west and drier, <laughs> drier and <laughs> cooler in the east. Um, and so that, oh, and before I move on, and that has important implications for some of the um, the needs and barriers that I'll talk about a little bit later about people's understanding of climate information in this region. Um, so when we went up, um, when we went up there, we did we mostly focused on key informant interviews. Um, we talked to federal wildlife managers um, and also state agencies. Um, we talked to management-oriented researchers, um, mostly based at USGS or at some of the um, various universities up there. Um, we talked to the NRCS personnel, we talked to water quality managers, and also um, several nonprofit organizations that are involved in waterfowl conservation. Um, and we included those, um, that last group, the nonprofits, again, particularly because um, conservation on private land in this part of the world is so important, and so they're very important actors um, in conservation. And so we had nine open-ended questions with conditional prompts and follow-up questions. And the reason that we organized our interview schedule that way um, was so, first of all, we could have comparability. So we had nine questions that we were asking every single interviewee um, so that we could compare their answers to those questions. But by allowing um, some space for people to bring up information that was important to them or maybe issues that um, our existing questions didn't quite encapsulate, that made sure that we weren't missing anything important because the reason we're talking to these people is because they're the experts in this area. And so we really wanted to draw out um, every bit that we, or all the information we could from them and give them the opportunity to also express um, some of the things that they were concerned about. Um, and we also used participant observation. And um, I guess I should have said at the beginning, I'm actually trained as an um, environmental anthropologist. And so anthropologists use participant observation as a method quite often in our research. And so I put up a definition that I actually like um, <laughs> of what partic participant observation is. Um, and so it's really a method in which, as a researcher, you are just present for the daily activities of people. You attend meetings. Um, you just kind of hang out in the spaces where decisions are being made. And in that way, you can understand both what people tell you through interviews, um, but also just kind of what happens and um, what the feeling is around those places. And then um, some of the things that maybe people don't tell you but or wouldn't even think to tell you, but just kind of come across from understanding a little bit um, more about their um, particular circumstances or their particular routines. Um, and that goes along with the recording of extensive field notes. And so when we actually analyze or code something, 
that's what we're coding, is the field notes where we write down kind of what we're seeing or what's going on. And then we also analyze state wildlife action plans from five different states um, in the Prairie Potholes region. And um, these state wildlife action plans are actually re, um, revised every 10 years. And in the most recent revision, they included climate change as an important consideration um, in the wildlife action plan. And so we were able to kind of look at how um, they were using these different plans used climate information, what information they were actually pulling in, um, and then if they noted any deficiencies or needs. Um, and kind of we were able to get those, glean those out of the state wildlife action plans and kind of add those to the mix. So we had three different sources of data, the interviews, the, method, the uh, field notes from the participant observation, and then um, the state wildlife action plans that we were looking at. Um, and so we analyzed all of these um, using Atlas TI software for qualitative data, which lets you code um, data in particular ways. And I'm happy to answer more questions about that if anybody has, um, at the end, if anyone has questions about how we actually do that. Um, but we had six predetermined codes that were kind of based on our interview questions. And then we had emergent, um, codes for emergent themes that arose during the data collection. So again, if, um, when we gave managers the opportunity to um, kind of express additional um, topics of interest, that way we were able to capture that in our analysis as well. And so some of our key kind of overarching findings were that managers in the Prairie Potholes region are really interested in projections for a drier future um, because that really impacts the um, hydrology and the ecology of this region. Um, but they're particularly interested because in recent years there's been a wet trend um, up in that part of the world. And so right now some of the problems they're dealing with um, in the potholes actually have to do with too much water um, or the draining of these areas um, in agricultural fields because there's too much precipitation. Um, but in the future, that might change. And so they're very interested in kind of the diverging direction um, of this weather and climate. Um, and they're also really um, interested, or well, one of the things as a social scientist I'm interested in, um, but one thing that came out in a lot of our interviews um, was the importance of really looking at the whole decision-making context, particularly the social and ecological um, context, when you're trying to address barriers to using climate information, and really even when you're trying to understand why people aren't using information that's already available. Um, so this is just kind of a, a graph of our um, interview responses. Um, so we had 16 key informant interviews with um, people who were, I should say, land and wildlife managers who were um, well-placed to sort of make these observations on a broader scale um, about organizational um, needs for decision-making. Um, and then we kind of, we grouped these interview responses into needs and barriers, and I'll get into those in a moment. Um, but first, we should point out that there's a lot of sources of climate information that are already in use by um, land and natural, uh, land and wildlife managers up in this part of the world. So, for example, the National Weather Service, um, seasonal info outlooks from NOAA, the U.S. Drought Monitor, um, and then some of the larger reports. So, the Great Plains Report, the National Climate Assessment, and the IPCC assessments. They're very well aware of the information that's available in those, um, and they use it to the extent that they're able. Um, they also rely a lot on local weather station data, um, information from the North Dakota um, State Climate, Climate Office um, was cited, and um, the Climate Office is really kind of a clearinghouse for it. They, they combine a lot of information, um, observational information, um, for current and past um, conditions in North Dakota um, from a lot of different other sites. So really it's an, it's an easy place for managers to go and get a lot of information from different sites at once. Um, and then they also really rely on research networks within the PPR. Um, so these are um, established networks that they have with researchers at regional universities. Um, these are people they see at research sharing events, and they also have um, periodic workshops where um, researchers and practitioners try to get together and share this information. Um, a lot of those are sponsored by the um, LCC up there. And um, they also, um, 
access peer-reviewed work, particularly if it's pre been produced from within these research networks. So they are aware of all of this information, and there is an overwhelming supply of information for them. Um, a lot of the managers really express kind of confusion of, well, there's all this information, but it's not necessarily the information that we need. Um, and that's a really important important point going forward, is that they don't just need more information. They need particular types of information, and they need guidance. So one of the main things that we found um, for, uh, or well, I should say that the managers in uh, most of our interviews identified three different information needs, or needs that we grouped into three different um, types. So the first is guidance on how to identify suitable projection products and how to actually use them. Um, in decision making. Um, and the second thing is they need climate projections at the scale suitable for decision making. And so we'll go a little bit more into what that actually means for them in a moment. And then they need additional observational information and seasonal forecasts. And this is important because while it, while it might not, the observational information might not key directly into a need for climate information, it's very much related. And you'll see how in just a moment. Um, but first, guidance. So they need to know how to select appropriate projections and downscale products, um, and they and how to use them for actual management decisions. So they don't just need to know what the information is, but they need to know the right information. So of all the GCMs, how do they choose, um, and then how can they actually incorporate that information appropriately into the decision that they're making? Um, and they want to know how to integrate that climate projection data into the impact models. Um, or other existing decision support tools. So um, beyond just having conversations about it or having climate information as a way to have kind of situational awareness of what might happen in the future, they want to be able to actually put that into their models or into existing tools that they've um, developed already. And then they also want to know about the differences between um, different models or different projection products like CMIP3 or CMIP5 and how that might impact um, some of the impact models or decision support tools that they already have. And this is a really, really important need. This was um, cited by 14 out of 18 um, of the interviewees, and it often came up multiple times in every single interview, or well, in those 14 interviews. Um, so this is just a pull quote from one of them. Managers feel like either folks are telling them, use these things that you can't understand and don't know how to integrate into your context, or Take time out of your busy schedule delivering things that are important and urgent to understand this stuff and then figure out how it fits in. And another person, another uh, researcher said, our big frustration is that a lot of the climate change scientists won't just tell you one way or the other. And, and I understand, they don't want to make a judgment call or anything. And so it's kind of coming from the other end where we've got a deadline, we've got a budget, and we've got to get a deliverable out. And we need to have the climate science people say, okay, I would recommend that you use this and here is why. And so you're already seeing in these quotes some of the institutional pressures and constraints that some of the managers are facing when they're trying to use this information, um, but also the kind of the differences between the climate science community and the potential users and how they might view information and communication about in that information. Um, so relevance, that was also something that was really important. It came up in 12 out of our 16 interviews. Um, people said that they need um, climate projections that are just relevant um, to the temporal, spatial, and ecological scales that they're interested in. Um, so finer scale information, um, in particular how it might be how changes in the future might be distributed spatially on the landscape. So they want to know about um, changes in the seasonal and year-to-year -year precipitation. And that um, is really important for different decisions about different species that they're trying to manage. Um, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, they also want to know about shifts of the dry periods during the summer months for the same reason. And then changes in the spatial pattern of precipitation, um, particularly as it relates to changes in the hydro period, both on the short term, kind of less than five years, but also longer term out. Um, and that's supposed to help them with planning now, but also um, planning for future conservation easements and where they should kind of think um, the limited amount of resources they have to procure those types of easements for the future. Um, and they also want to have projections of future temperature and precipitation, um, but they want to know how soon those changes might occur. So they don't necessarily want to just know that, you know, 100 years out, it's projected to be this, 
they kind of want to know the rate of those changes. Is it going to be kind of a uniform rate of change? Um, do we expect it to ramp up towards the end um, of the time period that we're talking about? For them, they really want to know those questions. And again, that's for longer term planning. Um, so one um, person told me, you know, they're pretty borderline for precipitation in North Dakota. That's the state he's speaking of. It ranges from 14 inches in the west to 20 inches in the east, maybe 22. So if you tack five extra inches on any of that, it makes a considerable difference. And it shows up on the landscape and how things respond. And water carries over too. So I mean, one thing I look at when I'm modeling stuff is the timing of the water. You know, if you get three inches all in one month and it doesn't rain in July and August, you're going to be pretty dry on the landscape. And so this quote is great because it really shows two very important things for the managers. It shows that they're working within a very slim margin of precipitation that can often be within the margins of error of some of these um, projection products or climate information that is available. Um, but it can also be just within the probable range of future variation. So those couple extra inches can really matter ecologically, but can be really hard to pin down from a climate information standpoint. Um, and also, it shows the importance of um, timing and seasonality in the rainfall. So for some decisions, annual rainfall, changes in annual rainfall just won't cut it. Um, and even seasonal rainfall in this case wouldn't be enough for this particular manager. Because if you um, chunk June, July, and August together and it, all the rain comes in June, then he can't really do, it, it changes how, uh, what happens in July and August, and that might significantly change his planning. Um, so again, it just shows some of the different time scales that are needed for some of these different, um, by some of these different managers for different management decisions. Um, so observational data and seasonal forecasts were also something very important. 11 out of um, the 16 of our interviewees cited this, and again, it came up multiple times in these interviews. And it was also cited in all five of the state wildlife action plans that we looked at, um, with particular emphasis from North Dakota, South Dakota, and uh, Minnesota. Um, so there's not really a whole lot of stations with long-term um, weather observations or time series data, and there's large gaps in the record. And so that's really hard for them when they're trying to kind of create a baseline to understand how climate and weather might impact wildlife and landscapes and then how it might do so, and then moving forward to how that might do so in the future. Um, they also really want long-term weather data and observations specifically related to the hydro period. So there's not a whole lot of um, wetland hydrology monitoring sites in the PPR um, that have these long data sets. And so again, it's very hard to actually make any type of, um, it's hard to make correlations between the wetland-related variables, the weather, and then the impacts on the particular species um, that the managers might be interested in. Um, and they also want additional monitoring sites to document these weather, climate, ecological relationships um, going forward so that they can facilitate adaptation planning in the future. And that includes things like, um, you know, evaluating or refining existing vulnerability assessments or adaptation plans. Um, and so um, one example of how they're hoping to use some of these, some of this information. Um, they'd like to use, they'd like to know more about um, ENSO and the precipitation and the impacts on precipitation and temperature in the PPR in order to better understand how that might impact particular species. And so in one study, um, they found that um, winter temperatures and fawn survival were closely correlated, uh, or fawn survival was closely correlated to winter temperatures um, in white-tailed deer. And so they're hoping to use um, things, information like that, the winter temperatures, and the ability to kind of um, forecast, okay, well, based on the ENSO cycle, can we expect it to be a colder, wetter winter? Um, should, will it be drier? Um, will it be warmer? In order to improve the estimates of deer populations and then give them a little bit longer, a three to six months um, jump time on decisions about hunting allowances. Um, so that they can make those decisions based on a little bit more population data that they might have, um, and then going forward they might just have um, better ideas about how many tags um, they should, or hunting allowances they should um, provide every year for people, or make available for hunters every year. 
Um, and so there's also a lot of remaining barriers. And a lot of these barriers, again, have resonance with um, some of the needs that I was just talking about. And in this section, I'm going to chunk together what we found with some of our discussion and recommendations, um, because I think it might just make a little more sense that way than trying to follow the um, argument all the way through. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about the limited understanding of weather climate ecological relationships, like I was just speaking about above. Um, this issue of lag time to move information down the pipeline from um, when it's produced by the climate community um, and then when it's actually access or accessible or usable um, by some of these managers. And then conflicting management priorities and some of the social context that goes um, into that. And then also, um, finally, the uncertainty and confusion about GCM projections. Um, so first, relating back to the last need that I just discussed, 69% of our interviewees said that they have a limited understanding of ecosystem responses to current climate as a barrier. Um, and they don't even have basic life cycle data or even presence and absence data on a lot of the species in their area. So for example, in North Dakota, they only know, um, they only have this data on about 150 of the approximately 600 species that they have. And these are predominantly game species that they know the most about. Um, but so a lot of the other species, and particularly those that might be um, kind of on, teetering on the verge of um, being threatened or needing more protection, they just don't know a whole lot about them. Um, and so the current understanding of many of these species life cycles is actually inadequate to identify the weather and climate um, factors impacting these populations. So it really is hard for the managers to say, okay, this is the particular type of climate information we need to support these types of decisions or to support long-term planning about this particular species or these particular populations or um, ecological communities because they just don't have some of that information from the ecological side. Um, and so that just kind of makes it even more difficult um, for them to know. So even if you ask them, they might not be able to give you a really good answer yet. Um, so one manager said, the species we're looking at, we just know so little about. So we're trying to get caught up on the basic range and distribution, presence and absence data, trying to understand what type of habitat variables these species need. And to get to the next level of actually collecting data as to climate, we're just not there with the majority of species. Um, and so another um, barrier that we found that a lot of people mentioned was um, this issue of lag time to move information down the pipeline. So, there can often be a lag time of several years from when um, there's the first GCM output from the climate science community into products that are actually usable or accessible in impact analysis um, to support some of these decisions. And this includes some of the, um, the expenses and even the time just needed to produce a downscaled product or just to, imp uh, to produce an impact um, model or some type of impact study. Um, so interviews express concern um, particularly over whether CMIP 3 based products that they had spent a lot of time and energy um, and institutional resources developing, they were concerned whether they would still be valid because basically right about the time that they were rolling these um, impact models or decision support tools out that use the CMIP 3 data, the CMIP 5 data became available. And so they weren't really sure if there was significant enough difference between those two products um, and how it might impact um, their impact models, if they should wait and then rerun them and then kind of re-incur the same time and expense and um, institutional expenditures on redoing all of these products, or if maybe the CMIP3 products would be just fine. Um, if maybe the, the variables they were interested in, maybe there wouldn't be enough of a difference um, to really necessitate an immediate rerun of some of those products and make, and so that they would still be valid. Um, and so they found that it was actually really hard, or they said that it was really hard for them to actually understand the differences, again, in like CMIP 3 or CMIP 5, um, but that there just weren't really any explanations that they could access and understand. Um, and that was true specifically as it relates to impacts on the PPR ecosystem. So as they were trying to relate that um, to their area. And so they really want clarification on these differences they, and, um, between CMIP 3 and CMIP 5. 
And this relates back up to the needs that I um, was speaking about earlier, where they want to know about shifts in seasonality, about precipitation, about both the amounts and the spatial, um, and how that plays out spatially on the landscape, um, and also the temperature and how those things all um, interplay. And they have, it, there are existing analyses, um, or are there existing analyses still valid? Do they need to update them? They really want to know that. Um, and if they did, um, or if they don't have time or the money right now to do, to update it with the CMIP-5 data, what kinds of um, caveats should they add to their CMIP-3-based products in order to kind of keep those valid? And then, will this issue just reoccur every single time a new um, coupled model inter comparison project happens or there, every time there's a new G GCM? And how will they be able to understand these differences? And that question just kind of adds more stress um, to this already limited time, financial, and personal resources that they have. Um, and then one of the third, I think I swapped these in my earlier slide, but um, third, the, one of the things that a lot of people were worried about was this um, issue of uncertainty and confusion about the GCM projections themselves. So um, a lot of our interviewees thought that the uncertainty or the range in climate projections were a barrier to effectively using that information. And they didn't understand what those um, ranges or uncertainties actually were or what they meant. Um, and based on available data from various sources, the managers said that they weren't really sure if precipitation in the prairie potholes region would increase or decrease in the future. And they were really unsure about what how that would impact the length of the hydro period, which is, again, very important for um, the number and um, quality of these prairie potholes, of these ponds, and for the species that depend on them, um, and so how those wetlands would actually be impacted. And furthermore, half of the interviewees were concerned over kind of this discrepancy that they saw between this recent wet trend um, that's kind of been occurring since the late 1990s, and the projections of a drier future, um, and how that kind of had different implications for wildlife management in the near future and the long term. So again, that issue of dealing with too much water now, and then dealing with maybe potentially not enough water in the long term. Um, and they were also worried about how their messaging to the public um, was being impacted by some of these perceived discrepancies. So if you're telling people that, you know, in 30 to 50 years, some of these potholes might dry up, we might not have um, the uh, wetlands anymore to support these species, then, but it's raining all the time and farmers are basically dealing with flooded fields, how do you kind of square that with your public um, without sort of losing faith, I guess, um, and still maintain your um, position as an important and valid uh, source of information for those people when you're trying to work with all of these private landowners with con for conservation purposes. Um, so some of the suggestions that we um, kind of came up with, um, well, some of the sources of confusion, I should say, um, first, are these studies that report information about annual versus seasonal changes, but they don't necessarily put those in the same context or even describe them in the same papers. Um, and then we have language that describes wetting or wetter conditions that doesn't necessarily refer to the same thing all the time. So sometimes it's precipitation and other times it's um, more complex and it refers to a combination of increased precipitation and increased temperatures. Um, and then finally, there's this issue of products based on different climatological periods or generations of GCMs. So they're not directly comparable. Um, and so a full review <laughs> of all of these different studies is a little bit beyond the scope of um, what I'm going to talk about today, and my expertise, I should say. But um, here's kind of an example. So I broke this into two slides, and I'll come back to the second part in a second, but um, just so that you can see it a little bit better. Um, this is from um, a paper by Ballard and um, et al., and it's projected changes in precipitation, and it's broken down by season. Um, and so you can, and I should say on the left, it's just the precipitation, but on the right, it's the combined effect of the precipitation, but also increases in temperature, or projected increases in temperature. Um, and so you can see for the spring in particular, 
there's going to be a lot more precipitation, but once you take into account the temperatures, that effect is lessened. And then in the summer, that effect becomes even more pronounced. Um, and so, for partic particularly for the prairie potholes region, these are the two seasons that really matter um, because a lot of it is, um, a lot of the hydrology of this area is driven by precipitation. So, um, this gives you kind of a bleaker picture or a drier picture of what the prairie potholes might look like in the future. However, um, we have other simulations um, that uh, show something a little bit different. So I highlighted in green, um, in kind of their explanation of the figure, some of the differences. Um, so this is an annual mean precipitation instead of broken out seasonally. Um, so that's one major difference. Um, these are multi-model means for, um, they use different emission scenarios. Um, basically, the previous one, I should say, used the um, RCP 8.5. Um, but this study was using um, the A2 and B1 scenarios, so different emission scenarios. Um, they're also using CMIP-3 data, whereas the Ballard study was using CMIP-5 data. Um, and it concludes that general, this, or this projection concludes that generally there's going to be increases in the northern Great Plains. Um, but then it breaks it out seasonally and it kind of shows the exact same thing. But again, it has different reference periods um, and it's using slightly different information. Um, but if you just looked at this, you would think that it's going to get a lot wetter in um, North Dakota in the future. Um, and so it's very confusing for some of these managers to look at these, these two different studies and just understand the nuances um, between these different projections and between these different products. And just to make it even more confusing, um, these two papers, Johnson et al. 2005 and a diff a Johnson but a different et al. 2010, um, they were trying to actually combine some of this climate information and then look at impacts on the landscape and how that might impact the hydrology, the hydro period, and hence the um, ecology of this area. And so what they were showing is that, you know, in the future you might expect a lot of the prime conservation areas to shift southward and eastward. Um, which caused the um, conservation community in this part of the world no small amount of angst since it costs a lot more money to restore wetlands or procure um, conservation, conservation easements in Iowa and Minnesota than it would in um, the Dakotas, for example. Um, and these two papers were brought up in almost every single interview. So these are very widely um, circulated and understood points of information um, amongst the people we were talking to. Um, so again, people without training in the climate sciences just might not understand these nuances, and they see these results as standalone information a lot of times. So they might just get one study instead of all three of those studies. Um, and they don't have information that synthesizes them or makes them easily comparable. Um, and then the managers, they do recognize the difference between these observed trends, that this observed wedding trend, and then the future climate projections but they want more certainty about how um, this might play out in the future, both spatially and seasonally, before they target conservation actions and investment based on this information. Um, so one man told us, if I change, um, or if I chase climate models down and it tells me in 50 years, 90% of the time, the only water you'll have is in eastern Alberta, I'm going to allocate our efforts to protect wetlands much differently than I would if it said 90% of the time it's going to be in northwest Iowa but those tools aren't sitting right there and they aren't available to me. Um, and so, you know, that's, I think that um, that in particular just kind of puts their conundrum in a nutshell is that they don't really know and they don't feel like they have the information in order to um, adequately plan for the future. But they can't just wait, so they do the best they can with the tools they have right now. Um, and then last, the last remaining barrier I'm going to talk about um, is the conflicting management priorities. And so this gets a lot into the socioeconomic context. Um, so these changes in land use um, spurred by these socioeconomic changes were at higher priority for most managers than climate change. And that is really an important thing to think about um, in the wider context of understanding the use, the needs, and the barriers of climate information. Um, because these processes prevent critical management issues, 
Um, it competes with longer-term issues like climate change for limited institutional resources. These um, managers only have a particular, you know, a certain number of people that work for them. They have set budgets, and they have to stretch those budgets to meet a lot of different needs. And so sometimes these current pressing needs just take precedence over longer-term needs. Um, and that was echoed in the state wildlife action plans. We saw that habitat loss, fragmentation, and degradation happening currently um, was cited as the key threat to priority species and habitats that they were trying to conserve. And so just another quote, um, that climate change is not part of the day-to-day -day dialogue. It's just not, because we're looking at losing wetlands. We're looking at losing grass. We're looking at low reproductive rates. And it's hard to look seven chapters ahead when we haven't dealt with things that create population abundance for the species in the present. And um, this quote in particular, I think, really hits home. It's hard to step back from the real proximate felt pressures that we know affect duck carrying capacity and duck recruitment. Because frankly, if we don't come up with the right public policy solutions, we won't have to worry about it in 50 years because we will have lost too much carrying capacity. Um, and so that's really important because it just kind of shows, it just kind of reiterates what they're up against when they're making these decisions. Um, and all of this is complicated by a political culture that's politicized climate change um, to the extent that it's made some managers less willing to actually talk publicly about using climate information to inform management decisions. So even if, this, even if climate information is being used um, or they want to use it, they're not as willing to explain to the public that this is why a particular decision is being made or why we're following a particular management strategy. Um, but it's not all bad news. We did find some um, potential places that you could, um, that climate information might make an entree. Um, so for example, we're calling these entry points. And these are opportunities to introduce information into decision-making processes. And this um, includes policy mandates and in recurring management decisions. So for example, um, the revisions of the um, state wildlife action plans that happen on a regular schedule. Um, it, you can um, kind of insert climate information into some of these processes to incorporate recommended or required best practices. Um, but you can also capitalize on existing relationships between trusted information providers. Um, and so, for example, um, you could use the Habitat, um, or HAPET, which is the Habitat Population Evaluation Team, um, which is a, an information um, sharing, I'm having a, a moment, an information sharing <laughs> website um, <laughs> that um, provides a lot of um, information about um, wild migratory bird life and the ecology up in that part of the world. And so a lot of our users um, talked about HAPIT as, or a lot of our interviewees talked about HAPIT um, quite often and using HAPIT as an important source of information. And then there's also ENDON, um, which provides, which currently provides a lot of observational information and it's geared towards the ag community, um, but it can be a really good source of current information for some of these, uh, for some of the managers we spoke to. Um, and even though it doesn't currently provide any type of forecast or climate information, it might be a good jumping off point to kind of link to those types of conversations. Um, I'm gonna skip this just in the interest of time. Um, but so some key lessons to take away from this research. So the interviewees do not need more climate data. They need more information on how to use climate information. Um, and so that includes both the description of the data set and how you might use it appropriately. Um, they need syntheses of these research findings, so to combine old information and new information and how those might be different. Um, and how, are the, how the evolution, or how the scientific understanding of climate change in the future has evolved um, from study to study, and then how that might actually impact the weather and climate and ecological relationships in their area of interest. Um, and then we also need to think about the socioeconomic context in which these management decisions are being made um, because that can condition the use or not of the climate information. Um, and that these social and institutional constraints, they cannot be remedied by delivering better science, right? That's outside the realm of climate science. But if you increase communication about um, climate information between the climate science community and the managers, it may help ease some of these barriers. Um, for example, by increasing awareness about new and existing informational products, 
or decreasing the time and effort that managers and management-oriented researchers have to spend um, to access and use that climate information. Um, so with that, um, I'll just say thank you very much, um, and thank you to all of the, a big thank you to all of the managers and researchers who spoke to us, um, and then also some folk up in the um, LCC, particularly Rick Nelson, um, and some folk here at um, PSC for commenting on this research throughout. So I will take questions if anybody has them. Um, this is Jill. I have a question. Yeah. Did any of your um, the the managers that you interviewed mention that they had any contact with the USDA uh, Northern Plains Climate Hub? Um, it seems like that would be a natural place where they might get some support for integrating climate. Um, Yes, in informal conversations, um, in some of the research sharing workshops or meetings that we attended, um, the climate hubs did come up, um, but actually in the interviews, um, they did not. Um, and, you know, that can just be an oversight on their part, and it could also be that we didn't prompt for that. Andrea, did you have something you Yeah, the add? other thing is most of the interviews were done in, what, summer 2013? 2014. 14, and so... The I'm trying to remember when exactly the hubs formally came into being, but they it's were pretty new. Fair, they were yeah, they are probably just like months old then. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, and the LCC up in that area was also fairly new at that point. Although, kind of the idea for this work came from conversations with Rick Nelson and some of the other LCC people. So the LCCs were a little bit older, but. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, but I did want to just, well, she's got the acknowledgement up there, but uh, a conversation a year or a year and a half before this with Rick was, kind of, and this whole idea that um, we, will this wedding trend in the northern, in the prairie potholes region continue, or is it really a natural variability, or is it climate change, was kind of, kind of a key part of the idea for the NSF proposal. Great. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Hi, Heather. This is Nina Burkhart, and I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so I really enjoyed your presentation. We've done a little bit of work in southwestern Colorado on a project, and this is one of the things that we looked at with some of these barriers and um, looked at barriers to adaptation. And so I had a, I had a question about one thing you mentioned. Um, you, I think you mentioned you said that there was some frustration that uh, with scientists, and I wanted to clarify whether they were frustrated because they didn't get advice on what, you know, tools, models, data to use, or if they were frustrated because people wouldn't tell them, um, you know, which scenario was most likely. We kind of ran into some of that in our study. So I was curious if you might talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so in some ways, um, and depending on the particular person that I would be speaking to, it could be both. Um, the particular quote that I put up there was actually, um, she was quite a savvy user of climate information. Um, so she understood that, you know, there wasn't going to be a particular most likely scenario for the future that, you know, that it was really hard or impossible to say, this is what will likely happen. This is what you should eventually plan for. Um, and she understood the, the reasons why that was impossible from a science perspective, but also from you know, just a practical planning perspective. Um, one of her key complaints was like, okay, so you can't tell me that, but could you tell me, you know, a range of products that would be, like these are the ecological variables or the climate variables that I care about for this particular decision. Can you give me guidance on which models or which projections or which products might perform best for those particular variables, um, you know, that might have the most skill in this area um, and that, you know, might have something to say um, about those particular, um, the, the variables, again, that she was really interested in. And so that was the particular quote I put up from that researcher, that's what that was referring to. Okay. But definitely from other people, we heard, like, you know, it would be nice if they could just tell us, you know, that it's going to rain five inches. Yeah. 
in this part of the land in 20 years, but if we had that kind of knowledge, one man joked, he's like, if I had that kind of knowledge, I'd win the lottery and I wouldn't need to be doing this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah, great. Okay. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Of course. Anybody else want to jump in with a question? Okay. Well, um, thanks again, Heather. I really appreciate the presentation. And um, I have a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Shannon. Oh, hi, hey, Heather. Hi, yeah. Shannon. Hi. Shannon. <laughs> Sorry, I was late. I, I don't know if you saw my email. I had to be on another webinar that overlapped with this one. Yeah. Um, so as a result, I missed the beginning of your presentation, and it left me wondering, and I don't know if you mentioned this or not, um, but it left me wondering kind of who the managers were generally and where hmm. they were um, throughout the region that you talked to. I'm just curious, like, what types when you when you talk about managers quote unquote like what's the mm -hmm. makeup of those managers yeah so we um we targeted land and natural resource managers up or well i should say land and wildlife managers up in mostly north dakota um mm -hmm. and that was kind of my personal call because i was really intrigued by a lot of the um the land use changes that were going on in that part of the world um some of the rapid um you know, oil and natural gas expansion, um, and also the ag expansion. Um, but then climatologically, also that wedding trend that Andrea mentioned. Um, and so that's kind of how we targeted North Dakota in particular. Um, and then the particular people that we spoke with, um, we were, ho we, well, we targeted people who were at, I don't know, what would you say, kind of like senior management, mid-management levels of these organizations. It's kind well, of hard to categorize them, but well, they weren't. you say that, most of them were focused on things either going on in North Dakota or the regions. Some of them right. were at subsections of North Dakota. They weren't necessarily the guy, <clears throat> the guy at the bottom of the, the what do I want to say, the organization. Like the wildlife or, management. Yeah, these weren't um, necessarily the people that were on the, um, on the ground stationed at the various um, like wildlife management areas. Um, like Andrea said, we were kind of trying to speak to people who had kind of a broader, um, I guess, influence over, that doesn't, that's not quite the right word I'm looking for, um, but that were in like the state or federal um, levels and so they were looking at the whole region um, or broad sections of the region and not just one particular management area, if that makes sense. So, like, it more in kind of regional offices type thing, state. Well, regional there's offices. regional, there's regions of North Dakota as well. Right. right. So we didn't, yeah. So yeah. So right. um, you know, we talked to people at like the um, Fish and Wildlife Service there, um, and then also like the state um, North Dakota Game and Fish, um, that agency. Um, we spoke to a lot of those folk. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the people that were overseeing um, North Dakota, like research projects that cross North Dakota and South Dakota, um, evaluating some of the habitats and trying to do kind of vulnerability assessments and things like that um, across mm -hmm. the Dakotas, those kind of folks. And people who were really more doing the planning kind of things because we were focused on climate change information. So we weren't trying to get at the people who were, who were whose main focus was like, what are we doing this year or next year, but longer term. Okay. Some of them also had some of those concerns, and that, and that was reflected if you heard, uh, if you heard some of the, uh, the quotes. Like some of them were trying to figure out what, how they're going to manage through this year or next year, but um, we were aiming more for people that had a bit more, a bit of a longer range view. Mm -hmm. So that okay. often didn't mean the person who was really on the ground doing what's happening this year. One of the one of the things that one, that interested us when we got this started was the thing that Rick Nelson had talked to us about, which is how do we decide where to do easements or various kinds of land agreements that um, Fish and Wildlife does with fiber property owners, and those kinds of things are typically for multiple decades and often for a hundred years. So we were they were looking a bit further out into the future and those kinds of decisions. Right, yeah. 
Cool, thanks. Yeah, I mean, we we can maybe talk about this more offline, um, getting into the nuances of it. But the re the reason that I asked is because I find that you know we, as a research community, tend to use the label managers rather broadly, and well, rather multiple meetings. Yeah. Right, and so to the agency people that it actually matters. It, that term has a specific meaning, and so like in the context of our BLM project. We have been we have been conditioned <laughs> to be careful when we use the term manager as opposed to another type of. So, what would um, you say agency. that it means to the agency people, and what agency people well, are you talking about? Again, that's why I think we should maybe have an offline conversation about it because it depends on who you're talking about, and it also matters in terms of the types of information. Those because you, as you just described you are talking to a certain subset of folks that are going to have a, a much different um, or maybe it, it probably was diverse within your within your interview pool um, but they have a much different you know set of information and set of concerns that they're looking at versus someone else who you know might be in a field office or whatever and so oh, those, absolutely those, yeah those distinctions matter which is why I was trying to get at what where within the system were you kind of targeting as you're getting this, these types of input and these types of information because that matters. So what would you um, call a person in a field office? Uh, it depends, but, you know, technician or staff. Like it, for the BLM project, um, we, when we're talking about those field office folks, we're not typically talking about the field office manager. We refer to them more broadly as, as BLM staff, for example. Mm -hmm. So again, it just kind of depends, which is why we don't necessarily need to get into the nuances of it right now. But it might be a conversation that we that we have offline. I would just I would encourage you to think about that uh, about that and unpacking or describing that a little bit as you're writing this stuff up because those distinctions do matter. Right. No, and it's a it's a point well taken. I I feel like it's a lot like the term stakeholder. <laughs> right. It could exactly. mean so many different things, and well, yeah, maybe exactly. we need to describe that a little bit more in and, and, more and detail than you were able to that, that which, is why I, which is why I'm bringing it up because some people will take offense to to those terms. So if you use, it's fine to use them. You just have to be careful about how you use them and describing what you mean or like qualifying what you mean as you're using them when you're, you know, when you're writing this stuff up and presenting this stuff, so. Okay, yeah, no, I'd love to pick your brain a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure thing. Thank you. Okay, great, thanks. Um, unless there's any, well, we're kind of over time, so I'm going <laughs> to just say thanks again to, uh, to Heather and Andrea, and um, we will get this recording um, archived and everything as well. So thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you, guys. Thanks, ladies. Bye. Bye.